um good evening good evening brothers and sisters i hope you guys are well um, i hope you are still kept under god's mighty hand i hope you have been seeing god's faithfulness and grace over your lives the lives of your family and the lives of fellow believers um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here gather with you once more where we seek to discuss and indulge in the issues of um, God's scripture and God's sovereignty and power and grace concerning our lives. Um, we are continuing with our series on prayerlessness. This is the fourth episode. God has been faithful. Um, God has been working and we, we are grateful for that, both in me and in you, hopefully. Um, and for that, we are thankful. We are, we are very much thankful. Um, and we pray, um, and we've been praying this throughout the week, that when it's all said and done, we will have this hunger and this zeal for the things of God. For prayer, our prayer lives will likely make sense, um, and God will work, and God will speak. Um, before I start, let me just pray. Father, we thank you for your presence and grace. You are God who is consistently on our side. Oh Lord, you are faithful. Even when we fail to be faithful, you are faithful. We thank you, Lord, that you have been with us throughout this series. We thank you, Lord, that you've been touching lives, testimonies have been coming. And, oh Lord, I pray that your spirit remains with us. I pray, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, that you open my eyes to what God is doing. You open my ears to what the spirit is saying. I pray that I speak your heart and not mine. I, sp I pray that I express your thoughts and not my thoughts. Be God and be God alone in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, again, thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, this is the fourth episode, as I've said, on our series on prayerlessness. Today we're going to be speaking on a very um, interesting topic um, in which I believe also has a say in terms of the state of our prayer lives and in terms of why there's so much prayerlessness amongst believers. And that is pretense. Today we are going to be dealing with pretense. Um, and we are going to be drawing some of our thoughts and convictions from Scripture itself and what Scripture tells us um, concerning things that we need to be aware of, things that we need to pay careful attention on. Um, today I'm going to be largely speaking on the Pharisees um, as they are the greatest example of pretenders. Jesus calls them hypocrites, nothing but actors. Um, and what wisdom can we draw from Jesus' words and what Jesus is cautioning us as the church, as believers today? But also the premise of Scripture. What is the premise of Scripture regarding our walk and regarding us being faithful stewards and genuine stewards towards the kingdom of God? Um, the Bible cautions us of two things. This is, this is where I want to start. The Bible seems to caution us of two extremes. One is being like the world. Secondly, is being like the Pharisees. Being like the world, you see this in Romans chapter 12, where the Bible says we should not conform to the patterns of this world, but we should be renewed in our thinking, in our minds. You find John, the apostle in 1 John chapter 2, verse, from verse 15, saying that, you know, we should not love this world, for if the love of this world is found in us, then we don't have the love of the Father. And he continuously says, in this world, there is nothing but the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that all these things are not from God. And he makes also the statement that the world is going to perish with all its desires, with all these lusts. But the word of God will remain forever. In fact, this is the premise of Scripture. Jesus says this, I think it's in Matthew chapter 24, when he speaks of the end of age or the end of all things, that when it's all said and done, even this world will perish, but the word of God will remain. This is the premise of Scripture. And the Bible cautions us that we should not be like the world. In fact, Jesus himself says, I have overcome the world. And the emphasis is that you too will overcome the world. So the Bible seems to caution, us, to, to, caution us, uh, to caution us in terms of being like the world. We have to be distinct from the world, right? We are set apart for God. We have to be set apart from the world and its systems and its lust and its evil ways. Because even the prince of this world is Satan himself. As a result, we cannot be subjected to his rulership. 
In fact, Paul also echoes these words in the book of Hebrews. Well, I believe he's the writer of the book of Hebrews anyway. But the book of Hebrews echoes these words that this world is not our home. But we are nothing but temporary residents in this world. So the Bible cautions us from being filled with the world within us, from being believers who are worldly. That's why even in our churches, we should not stop preaching and cautioning and calling believers out of the world into the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of light, which is the kingdom of the Son of God. Now, that's one extreme the Bible cautions us of. The other, but the other extreme that we are being cautioned on is being like the Pharisees. But this doesn't make sense, Jesus. Uh, the, the Pharisees were pious people, the Pharisees were righteous, right? But being, them being righteous or them being pious was more externally orientated rather than internally, right? Their righteousness was for showmanship, was to be seen by the people, was to show people how righteous they were. But as a result, it did not translate to their spiritual lives. It did not translate to their private lives. In fact, Jesus brings this up when he speaks of them being hypocrites, nothing but actors and pretenders. So we are being cautioned to not be like the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus even goes on to the extreme that your righteousness, speaking to me and you, that our righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. Because without that, we won't be able to inherit the kingdom of God. So basically, Jesus is saying, yes, they are righteous, but their righteousness is not one that's able to lead them to, be, to inherit the kingdom of God. Their righteousness does not make them heirs of the kingdom of God. Why? Because their righteousness is externally focused, is of this world. But the righteousness I'm calling you to is the righteousness that's able to give fruit of the Spirit, is the righteousness that's able to preserve you, is the righteousness that's able to make God look upon you with nothing but grace and love. It's the righteousness that's submitted under the mercies of God. This is the righteousness that makes us be able to attain the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus cautions the disciples that when they pray, when they fast, when they give, they must not do like the Pharisees who do all these things so that they can be seen by men, they can be applauded by men. And he even goes on to say that they have received their reward in full, meaning there's no, there's no exception. The applause of men is what they've received in this world. But when you do these things, you must do them knowing that God is the one who ultimately rewards you. Do them in private without no one actually seeing, without the expectation for applause, without the expectation of, con co com uh, of being commended. Do these things without those expectations. And God who sees you doing these things secretly will reward you publicly. So there's a righteousness we must attain, and that righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And in Matthew chapter 23, I want us to just read this. I think it will be helpful. Still speaking of the Pharisees and what scriptures is cautioning us against. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 23. He's speaking about the Pharisees and the scribes, right? He's, he's coming against them. And in verse 3, he says, So practice and obey whatever they tell you, speaking about the Pharisees. He says that the disciples, me and you, we must practice and obey whatever they tell us. But don't follow their example, meaning they have, un, they have good things to say, but they don't necessarily leave them out. That's the, spirit, that the spirit, that's the spirit of the Pharisee, that they preach great verses, they quote scripture, but they fail to live out the very same verses they quote. So he says, it's fine. Listen to what they have to say, because what they are saying is, is, is what God says anyway concerning the church, concerning your lives. But when it comes to walking as they walk, don't walk as they walk. Right? For they don't practice what they teach. And this is the great issue with the spirit of a Pharisee. When we preach things that we don't practice. And in verse 5 he says, everything they do is for show. Everything they do, how they live, the things they say, they do it so that they can be seen by men as though they are righteous. They want to sell this image of righteousness. They want to bring forth this portrayal of righteousness yet lacking it in terms of walking in it. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra um, long tassels. And it starts to speak of appearance. They even go to the extreme of their dress code. They want to appear as powerful. They want to appear as pious. They want to appear as righteous, yet lacking the fruit 
of or the power of righteousness itself. Right? They, they, they want to be godly, but they lack the power of godliness. And this is what scripture is cautioning us against, being like the Pharisees. So there are two extremes that the scripture is warning us against, being like the world, but also not being too self-righteous, warning, against, warning us against self-righteousness. Now, let's speak on the Pharisees or Phariseeism and what this is, right? Because sometimes we think of the Pharisees based on what Jesus says in the Gospels, which is right, which is necessary, which is helpful. But obviously there's history, there is more to the Pharisees than what we have come to know. Because the Old Testament doesn't necessarily give us much in terms of the sect of the Pharisees. But the Jewish scholar um, who is known as Josephus, who is a Jewish scholar, historian, um, has often been a very helpful resource or a helpful um, source or reference when it comes to the Christian faith and Judaism it, uh, itself. Um, he had a lot to say about the Pharisees. He had a lot to say in terms of how they lived. He had a lot to say in terms of the events of the day and the culture and the system that they operated in. So one thing we learn about the Pharisees is that they existed around the second temple building, around the second temple era. The second uh, temple era was an era after the children of Israel had returned from Babylon, after they had returned from their exile in Babylon. And this is the time in which the Pharisees are believed to have existed and have come to a place of influence, to what we have come to know today. Um, these men, as, as Josephus um, 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 speaks, he speaks of them as men who were learned, he speaks of them as men who were strict, he speaks of them as men who held customs with nothing but strictness. They had a firm hand when it came to the law of God. And as a result, they ended up becoming um, influential amongst the Jews and amongst, the, amongst Judaism itself as a faith. Right? And um, there were even other sects around them. And the New Testament speaks of them. He speaks of the Sadducees. We are introduced to the scribes. We are introduced to the chief priests. We are introduced even to the um, Hero Herodians. Um, Herodians were basically a sect of the Jewish faith or a sect of the Jewish political or religious party or sect that was more um, loyal to Rome and loyal to Herod. In fact, they were called defectors of the day. They were more reliant and they were more inclined to Herod and his systems, even though they were Jews, right? So there were differences amongst the influential religious sects around Judaism, those who were held to have a firm uh, grasp in terms of the law, and those who were seen as liberal. Even amongst the Pharisees themselves, there were two camps or there were two schools of thought amongst the Pharisees themselves. One, you had the camp of um, um, Shammai. The camp of Shammai was seen as a conservative camp, meaning they were strict in terms of the law. Um, the difference between the camp of Shammai and the camp of Hillel is that the camp of, the camp of Hillel was liberal. They were what we call free thinkers. They were what we call progressive Pharisees, meaning they progressed with the times, they progressed with the age. Their concern was to apply the law of God to the changing social stance. While the camp of um, um, Shammai was more conservative, meaning they were more inclined to the old ways of doing things, to the traditions of the Jews. Um, so, so these are some of the camps that are not necessarily easily expressed in scripture, but they were there. And the Pharisees were not just one camp, or the Sadducees and the Pharisees were not just one camp. There were differences amongst the camps. There were differences amongst who was influential. But the Pharisees had come to a place of prominence, had come to a place of influence as being the standard of the Jewish faith. Um, and when we speak of the Sadducees, um, Josephus even says that the Sadducees themselves subjected themselves to the Pharisees, meaning they upheld the Pharisees as the standard, even though they disagreed with them uh, uh, in terms of some of the fundamentals of the, Juda uh, of the Juda Judaism faith or of the Jewish faith, yes, of the Jewish faith. Um, for example, the Pharisees believed in um, the resurrection, meaning life after death. 
Um, the Pharisees believed in divine spirits. The Pharisees believed in angels. And the Pharisees believed in the oral and written law of God. But on the other hand, you had the Sadducees who did not believe in any of that. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead or they did not believe in mortality. They did not believe in divine spirits or angels. And they only believed in the written law of God as the standard. What was the written law of God? The written law of God was just the Torah. They believed that the Torah was the standard. While the Pharisees, especially the liberal camp, believed that even the oral laws of God, meaning the laws that would come through, maybe what Abraham would have to say or what the prophets would have to say, they believed that to also be a law. They would establish those as laws. But the Sadducees only believed in the Torah as the written law of God. So even amongst the political and religious sects of the day, there were differences. But the funniest thing is that whenever we see Sadducees and Pharisees or Sadducees and the scribes or the scribes and the Pharisees, it seemed as though they were working in unison. Why? Because they had a common enemy. They had a common enemy who was Jesus. So irregardless of them disagreeing on some of the fundamentals of the Jewish faith, when it came to Jesus being crucified, they made it their um, thing to work together so that they can trap Jesus and as a result, Christ can be killed and crucified. And they can do away with this troublesome person because he's bringing disruption, he's proclaiming a different faith, even though they missed the old prophet um, um, prophecies, they missed the old prophecies, they missed the prophecies that were made by Jesus, right? But they were working in unison, they were working as one in order to get rid of the common enemy. I, sp I spoke of the Her uh, Herodians, um, how they were hated amongst the Jewish people because Her Herodians were nothing but defectors. They were nothing but sellouts, if I could say. They, were, um, they, they gave in to the Roman system. They saw themselves as one with the Roman system. They were loyal to Herod. And this brought so much hate and, and hostility amongst the Jewish people. But because Jesus was the common enemy, you find in Luke, um, in Mark chapter 12, when they go to Jesus and try to trap him and ask Jesus about paying taxes to, you know, to Caesar and paying taxes to the, 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 the Roman um, 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 government. Um, the Bible says the Pharisees and the Herodians were there, meaning both of them at that point worked as a team in order to trap Jesus. They had a common goal. So you see these sects, I'm not going to touch on the differences between them and you know, getting into details, but on a high level, those are different sects. Even in the Pharisees, there were two camps. I spoke of the camp of um, Shammai that was, a bit, that was strict and the camp of Hillel that was a bit more liberal. And in fact, you see this even with Paul, uh, because Paul, even how he is, he, Paul was a Pharisee. He even says that he was a Pharisee. Um, and he, the way he was able to apply the Old Testament scriptures to the modern day circumstances, right? Even when he speaks to the churches, the church of Rome, the church of Coloss, the church of Thess Thessalonica, the church of um, Philippi, all the churches and the letters he's writing to these churches, he's able to draw wisdom from the Old Testament, right? Which shows a part of him that was a bit more liberal, meaning he was not, he was not close-minded. He knew how to apply the word of God in all circumstances. Just like how if I were to quote verses like this, um, I would have to be able to apply them to your life to say, yes, Jesus here is speaking to the Pharisees, but this is how it applies to me and you. So Paul seems to have that free spirit and a way of interpreting scriptures in an open mind. He was able to apply scriptures concerning justice. He was able to apply scriptures concerning persecution. He was able to apply scriptures concerning the coming Messiah, meaning the second return of Christ. He was even, even able to recognize scriptures as a fulfilled prophecy of Jesus coming and having died for the sins of men. But again, we see an element of Paul that was a bit more conservative, that was a bit more strict. Why? Uh, Paul, before he became, um, I mean, bef before he, he, his encounter with Jesus, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he had made it a, 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 a goal, a, an objective to himself to do away with the Christian faith, right? He imprisoned, he, he killed, he committed horrific crimes in the name of Judaism, in the name of being a Pharisee. 
So we also see the strict hand of Paul that he also had that strict hand. So this could be a perfect balance also that um, he was not too liberal, but also he was not too conservative. As a result, he was able to give a perfect balance when he became a, 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 a disciple of Jesus, that he was even able to speak to the Jew and also speak to the Gentile. Speak to the Jew in a strict manner, speak to the Jew in a liberal manner, but also speak to the Gentile in a liberal manner as well. So there were two camps, and we also hear that how Paul was taught under the school of uh, Gamaliel, and Gamaliel also strikes us as one who had a level of wisdom. In the book of Acts, when they wanted to persecute um, the disciples, Gamaliel says, look, um, I wouldn't suggest that you kill these men because we know what happened to some of the people that came before them. He quotes uh, people that came and had followings, and amongst them was a man called Judas, and how he, he had a religion, if I could say, uh, and he had followers that were following him, about 400 men, but he was killed, and as a result, his followers were scattered. And Gamaliel, being one who strikes me as one who was liberal, uh, he says, look, let's try to apply that same way of thinking to these people people, these disciples who are speaking about this Jesus, right? He's saying, if this thing is indeed of men, it won't go anywhere. Just like those men I've referenced who came with um, religions and, 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 and had followings and everything that they had built was destroyed in a day. If these men, what they are saying is not from God, this will also not go anywhere. But if God is the one who's working through these men, we must be careful lest we find ourselves working in opposition of God. So we see uh, Gamaliel being someone, because the Bible says he was respected, and as a result, when he entered the room and spoke, they gave him their ears. And after he said this thing, they just took the disciples, they beat them, and they told them not to speak um, about Jesus again. And the disciples were filled with joy because they were persecuted for their faith. Um, but we're not there. So there, was, there were certain camps within the Pharisees themselves, and we're not going to touch... On, on all of that. But it is just to give a premise or an idea of what the Pharisees were or who the Pharisees were. And Jesus cautions us that we should not pray like the Pharisees. And from the verses we have read, he has an issue with them that they do not practice what they teach. Now, how does this thing align with prayerlessness? Prayerlessness becomes difficult when we practice publicly what we don't do privately. When publicly we are these prayer warriors, but privately we are prayer dwarfs. We are, not, we are non-existent. Our prayer lives is non-existent. We show face, right? We, we sound powerful in church. We sound powerful amongst friends and believers. But in the private space, we are dying. In the private space, there's nothing happening. There's no revival. And this is the spirit of the Pharisees in the church. He says, in verse 5, everything they do, Matthew 23, verse 5, he says, everything they do is for show. We become Pharisees when everything we do is for show. How we preach, our fasting, how we give, how we pray, you know, is all for show. It's all to be seen. Because that's the image we are selling. But privately, there is no resemblance of that. Because prayerlessness comes when what you do publicly does not translate to what you do privately, right? And because what you do publicly does not translate to what you do privately, you have to put on a show. You have to act as though you still have it together. And that's why sometimes Simangala, when the brother or his sister falls, falls into sin, and we're like, ah, Unjabula tanda zaganga, no, Unjabulo was able to show his... And sometimes it's not a matter of pretense. Sometimes it's just a matter of what he, this is what we desire. This is, this is, this, these are our um, um, heart desires with the Lord. To, to, and, and God also will use us in our certain gifts. God will elevate us. God will use us. God will use us to impact and influence. But in our private space, there is no reconciliation. That we are not open to God working with those uh, sinful areas of our lives. Because even especially as young ministers, the danger is that when God elevates you and puts you in a place where you're able to influence and speak, we sometimes overlook the sins that we have to do away with. The Bible tells us it's the little foxes that are able to destroy the vineyard. So when we ignore the little foxes 
and think just because I preach, just because I get invited, just because when I pray, you know, something happens, just because things happen, we start to ignore those little foxes that are eating away from not necessarily our destiny in terms of church, but our destiny with God. Because ultimately when it's all said and done, we must have a destiny in Onkulunkulu. We must be those who are inheritors, those who inherit, those who are heirs of the kingdom. So this is how sometimes when we play pretense, when we take the spirit of the Pharisees, we find ourselves struggling privately with, our, with prayer, yet publicly we are powerful. And we are dying privately, but publicly we are showing signs of life. And this is the spirit of the Pharisees. So Jesus is saying those things, Guti. It's when we practice what we don't teach, and it's also when we do things for the show. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking about prayer. And let's go to this, because we are not necessarily touching on many things, but we are still touching on prayer. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading the NLT version, because I, I, I believe it's easy for the believer and the unbeliever, because it doesn't have words, you know, when it doesn't have those words, um, that many believers will be comfortable with or will easily understand you know some people are not believers in the faith and they listen to this and they want to come to salvation so it's easier to communicate the word of god with the nlt because it's plain english is the english that we use every day but also it, it preserves um the the word for word meaning of scripture right it does not deviate from the word for word just like your passion translation which is a translation directly from the pits of hell and other translations but I'm not there today. Um, NLT. It says, uh, um, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Um, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 7. It says, when you pray, you speak about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners in the synagogues where everyone can see them. So he's saying, don't pray for the showmanship. Don't pray so that you can be seen that you're praying. And in Tobini Kulumoguti, it's, 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 as though we have taken the spirit upon ourselves. But it's more important that we are seen to be righteous than we are actually righteous. That it's more important for us to be seen as prayerful rather than us actually being people who are prayerful. Because if you don't recognize good, you are prayerless. And you don't recognize good, you need help when it comes to just praying. Every time you get into the public platform and you pray and you pray, uh, you know, descends and God starts to do things, you will think you are fine. But privately you are dying. So Jesus has an issue with how they would pray. They would pray to be seen. They would stand in street corners. And he says, I tell you the truth, that is the reward they will get, the applause of men. But this is how me and you must pray. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to the Father in private. Then your heavenly father who sees everything will reward you publicly. So Jesus is advocating, Guti, before you can be rewarded publicly in terms of the things that you'll do publicly, God advancing you, God rewarding you, God elevating you publicly, there must be a desire to pray privately. There must be a prayer life. When we speak of prayer life, we're not speaking of praying in church. We are speaking of a life that is full of prayer. And most of our lives are lived privately. Majority of our lives are lived privately, not publicly, unless we turn to born. But most of the most of us, more of weeks in we won. More in Dozaku we won. Ipsugu manji ni won. These are the times that are telling Guti, where is my heart founded? Where is my faith founded? Is it on God or is it on man? Because if it's on God, I will seek God even in this private place where no one sees me, when the cameras are off, when social media is off. I will seek God privately. But if me and I'm all concerned about you know, these things, but privately I don't do those things, then there's an issue. There's a spirit of a Pharisee that's working. Verse 7, it says, When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by pre uh, repeating their words again and again. And he's speaking of praying without paying mind. To it. One thing I asked Uncle Uncle, especially with tongues, because the tongues are a gift of God, but sometimes, man, you know, among us with two teen, it's easy to default to tongues. And unfortunately, sometimes what happens, Guti, 
We don't pay mind to what we are, we are doing. We don't pay mind to the activity that is being done. Just because you are praying in tongues doesn't necessarily mean you can pray in tongues and scroll on Facebook. Or just because you are praying in tongues doesn't mean you can pray in tongues and then finish that thing you are doing. Yes, praying without ceasing means you are praying without stopping, meaning you are praying about everything and everywhere. But we must pay mind to the activity of prayer. We must be solely invested in the activity of prayer. More tandas are everything must be put aside and you must pray. and you are busy scrolling through WhatsApp. Some people do that. You know what I mean? So Jesus says, don't do this. Don't babble. Don't, don't say things for the sake of saying them. There must be intentionality when you say things. You must do it with intentionality. You must do it intensely so. He says, don't be like the Gentiles. For the Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Now, let's, let's continue because I don't want to take time. So, Jesus is also cautioning us of how not to pray, but also he tells us how to pray. And this translates to how me and you can go in terms of prayer and do away with the sin of prayerlessness. Now, the Pharisees followed the law of God externally, right? And there were external people. I must be seen as though I'm doing it. I must be seen... I must be seen, I must be seen. And one thing that we cannot fault them on is that we can't say they were not praying. No, they were praying. The Bible says they prayed every day. We can't fault them, which about fast. You know, they were fasting. They were fasting twice a week. We can't fault them, which they were not giving, they were not tithing. They were doing all these things. But Uncle Uncle has an issue with the motive. They were doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. So now in our way, we could be praying, but we could be doing it for the wrong reasons to be seen by men. We could be attending church, but we could be doing, for, we could be doing it for the wrong reasons. To be seen by men, which I say, you know, or people beat, or what people beat, or conference, right? We could be doing all these right and good things, but for the wrong reasons. Some of us could even be building relationships with fellow brothers and sisters, but so that with Sasa, the brother and the sister must invite you to their church. Good things for the wrong reasons. And this is where Jesus has an issue with the heart. The righteousness of the Pharisees, although they were doing the right things, they were doing them for the wrong reasons. So this is where the issue is. And Jesus has an issue with their hypocrisy. Amongst many things Jesus spoke about, he spoke about hypocrisy. Amongst many things Jesus detested was hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, being an actor. Hypocrisy just is a Greek word that means an actor, pretender, right? If you look at the Hollywood movies, the person who plays John the Baptist, this is, this is, a, this, this is a definition of a hypocrite, this is a definition of an actor. On screen, they are portraying a holy prophet of God. But that person, that person, Yapuza, Yatagwa, you know, he, he, he lives a sinful way. That's a, hypoc a hypocrite. It's someone who sells a certain image, but privately they are doing something different. If Hollywood now makes a movie about Jesus and we see the Messiah who is without sin, the person who's playing that part is a hypocrite. Why? Because on screen they are portraying a life that is without sin because Christ himself was without sin. But Lomuntuloy in their literal lives in their private lives who in which that's who they really are they obviously have sin because neither of us are without sin and some of them we told that's the essence of hypocrite that's what jesus was telling them that these people are nothing but pretenders what you are seeing here is acting and unfortunately as a church man we have built a system we have built up as alone who are good actors they know the right words to say they know the right things to say. They know how to, appropri to appropriately behave. They know how to... By us, man, how do you play church, man? What, what, what goes with church? I was even saying this to my wife. Sometimes we pray. I, I, I have issue with rehearsed prayers. Prayers that are rehearsed. Prayers that... Uzu, Guti, Abu Mama Bech used to pray this prayer like this. And we prayed like that. But now, do we necessarily understand or is, it, is this necessarily coming from the heart? 
Because if not, then we are doing nothing but pretending and showmanship. Because prayer must not be rehearsed. Prayer must be genuinely from the heart. You know, it's good, but do you know that, do you know Lifika King, do you know the essence of it? Is he really Lifika in your life? Or Bomea Barapela or Muruta Rapela, he uses those powerful words and as a result, we just take those words, we borrow those words and we put them in our prayers. Right? Um, it, 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 it's a matter of, we know, how, we know if this sounds like this, it's associated with power, it's associated with righteousness. If Mang Shumayelang forget the peace, the appearance already says, man of God. But will the believers even receive me if I'm doing Fagichin and Amatei, Neskipanyana, and I'm still speaking the heart of God? Because someone will say, I mean, I, I won't listen. Nengi mamiling nengi zo shumai la Fagichin Neskip, and some will say, I mean, I nengi Fagikolo, you know, I can't receive them. Or if I have Fagikolo, I cannot, I cannot receive them. It's a matter of pretense. What looks powerful? What sounds powerful? Is it that the reason why we have Believers who know how to pretend and play church and believers who are defeated privately but look powerful privately, could it be that we also have built an environment that advocates for pretense? We have built an atmosphere as a church that says we must look a certain way, we must sound a certain way, we must act a certain way. And as a result, people cannot translate that to their private spaces. To say Magatandaza, this person they pray in a different way than they pray in church. Uti Marashumela at this place, they preach differently than they preach in church. Uti Marakoga will sound differently than they wear a sound in late. And sometimes we might think, yeah, I won't. We bambile. No, but they are doing it so that Tina si jabule, uti, skavang uti bambile. But he's not doing necessarily from the place of conviction and from the place of his heart. Could it, could it be that reason why we are seeing believers who are defeated privately is because we are raising a generation of pretenders. We are raising a generation of Pharisees who are more concerned with righteousness that is external rather than righteousness that's internal, that's able to bear fruit. Could it be that that is what we are doing? Could it be that we are the descendants of the Pharisees in all that we do? Because this is how then our prayer lives are affected. We don't necessarily translate what we do privately to the public space and also what we do publicly is not translated to our private space and affect, it affects how we read the word it affects how we do things it affects the kind of believers we are and I'm saying this because I think both parties are to blame the believer and the church the first act or the first sin that was committed in the church was the sin of hypocrisy the first, 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 first. You read this in the book of Acts. Let's look at Acts 5. The first sin that came over the church was hypocrisy. And I want us to see how the disciples dealt with hypocrisy because they knew good if the leaven of hypocrisy can be allowed in the church, it will be able to influence where we raise believers who are not genuine, believers who are liars, believers who are pretenders. Believers are in the way to but necessarily that's not being drawn from their heart. Believers who are showmen, who does who do things for showmanship. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 5. Let's read from verse 1. I'm not going to read all of it, but let's read from verse 2 actually. We're going to be touching on verses. You can read it your uncle in your, in your private space. Verse 2 he says, He brought. Okay, let's start from verse one. But there was a certain man. Uh, there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it to be the full amount. He's claiming it to be the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. Verse 4, the property was yours to sell or not to sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. 
what is what what is what is what is the apostle saying here? We seeing hypocrisy already here. We seeing hypocrites. Ananias and his wife make a, make certain agreement. Safara, they agree that you're gonna sell property. Yeah, bo. no one is forcing them. No one is forcing their hand. Yeah, bo. they want to be like the other believers, right? They want to seem as though they're caring, they're righteous, right? They concern themselves with other people. They are part of the church. It's all good. And they sell their property, but they keep some of the money for themselves. And the apostle is shocked with how not. Wasn't this property yours in the first place? Because Unkulunkulu, the reason why he kills, because both of them die because of the sin. God has to kill. Because, that's how he detests uh, hypocrisy. He killed them to set an example. When we become Abazalan who are hypocrites, there's something afire inside of us. So he has to set an example. He has to root out hypocrisy from the church. So what happens? This property was theirs in the first place. They could have decided to sell. They could have decided not to sell. But they chose to sell. And God's issue with them is not because they didn't give Imali. Even if they chose to give half, they, they was, they was, it's going to be fine. Because Uncle Unkulu wants a cheerful giver. Even if they give 50% of the proceeds they had made from selling their property, God was going to be fine because they were honest in their giving. God has an issue with them saying they are giving 100% yet they are giving a portion of their money. That's where the issue is. Uncle Unkulu, when it comes to hypocrisy, he has an issue with you saying one thing and doing the other. He does not have an issue with you doing this thing and saying, saying it and doing it. He doesn't have an issue. But the moment you appear powerful publicly, but privately there's no relationship, that's where he has concern. That's the sin that wanted to enter the church. And the apostles had to root that sin out. They had to root that thing out. And Uzuti no Peter, Uti, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart? So the spirit of Hypocrisy is a spirit that's perpetuated, that's driven, that is influenced by this by Satan himself. Umzalwani, who is a hypocrite, and again, hypocrite means a pretender. But in your private space, it's a spirit that is driven by Satan. If I could say it in those terms. Because you're not being genuine. Privately, you are indulging in alcohol consumption, publicly, you are rebuking Privately, you are dealing with sisters. Publicly, you are shining brothers. How not? This is where God has an issue. Something something's not sure. Something does not make sure. Something does not balance. Something according to an offer. Because privately, you are indulging in these things. Publicly, you are condemning these things. This is the spirit that is perpetuated by Satan. And saying, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. How? Ananias, how did you lie? Did Ananias say anything? No. He's lying through pretense. When you are a person who pretends, you are a liar by your actions. You lie to the Holy Spirit. He's saying, it's not an offense to us. When you become a hypocrite, you're not necessarily offending people. You're not necessarily offending the church. But you are, li you are lying and offending the Holy Spirit. You are lying to God himself. Because you are showing this face, Ibantuin, you are showing this face. You are not deceiving people per se, but you are deceiving God. You are lying to the Holy Spirit. And we know what happens to the wife. The wife comes and she tries to say the same thing, and now she dies. So the apostles did not lack discernment. That's why they were able to not only identify hypocrisy, but root it out and set a standard and an example and a precedence for believers to say, this is how God deals with hypocrisy. So sometimes even as a church, that's why I'm saying I'm blaming two entities, even as a church, we allow hypocrisy to thrive. Whereas we brother, man, brother busy, but you still give the brother the platform. Knowing to sister busy, you still give the sister the platform. You are creating an environment where hypocrisy thrives, where you are building up and training up pretenders. You have a training camp of pretenders. And unfortunately, when it's time for those pretenders to be sent to the world, they go to places and they go to um, environments and they start churches that 
are rooted in hypocrisy. And as a result, because they were trained to be masters of hypocrisy, they build a generation that is full of hypocrites. Jesus says to the, to the Pharisees, to a point, even when you go over land and go over sea and recruit people for yourself and recruit disciples, he says, you make them twice as much children of Satan as you are. Oguti, the spirit of hypocrisy, not only does it affect you, but the people that are born as a result of your teachings and your training, they become worse than you. So, the reason why we are defeated in our prayer lives is because sometimes, you must check, Oguti, are you a pretender? What you do in the private place is it translated to what you do in the church. But are you indeed a prayer warrior in a private space? It's something about was a preaching machine, but was someone who, who has a hunger for souls. But now we want to still have the hunger for souls. Someone said, Guti, I must I might mess this thing up because I'm I'm just in, in the spirit of this the Pharisees man. Someone said, Guti, you the world must hate you because of Jesus. It's fine, it's it's, it's, it's acceptable. But the world must not hate Jesus because of you. You don't care for people. You are mean. But publicly, you always tell us how you have a hunger for souls. Calling the off. And Uncle Uncle has an issue because he can't work if calling the off. Could it be that the reason why you don't pray as you should is because? You pretend that everything is okay in church and public spaces amongst brethren. I've come to be someone who does not necessarily get excited with fake conversations. I love genuine conversations. Conversations where as brothers, as, as brethren, whether it's a brother and a sister, a pastor or not, we speak about issues. We speak about how can we work around these issues or how can we grow as a people. How good in our conversations? Hey, buddy, hang up on a man, hang up. Hey, on a man, hang up. It's good to exhort one another. It's good to commend one another. But when it's all said and done, we must be able to encourage one another in the ways of God. We must be able to bear each other's burdens. We must not care about appearing powerful, but we must walk in power through us submitting ourselves to the one who carries the power, the source of power, which is God. I long for genuine conversations. I, there, there's, there's, there, there, there are groups of people that you, Mount, Mount Nabo, you, you come out of there revived. Not with you, hey, hey, Mount Kulumile, man, I'm a Kamama Kuli. No, but you must come out of there saying, wow, I never saw it like this. God help me. God help me. I want to hunger for you even more. Could it be that the spirit of pretense is as a, is as a result of a church that does not have discernment? A church that makes it a safe space, a church that trains and grooms pretenders, and also believers who are pretenders themselves, and as a result, they are dying and they cannot speak, yet they are dying because there is an image that they've sold publicly that they cannot go against. Bazotinin, I confess, they are struggling with these things. Bazotin, Jungo, Sister Bangas, and Kula Ramnadi, Mangbachel, with him, I call it Bambil. Jesus has an issue with you. Pretender. Jesus has an issue with you, actor. And this is the spirit that God wants to deal with. Father, we pray for grace. We pray for resolve. Give us solutions, Holy Spirit. Forgive us for our sins. We repent for pretending that we have everything figured out. We pretend that we, we forgive us, Lord, for pretending that we have everything figured out. Where we don't confess our sins to you. Where we don't lay everything at the feet of Jesus. Jungo Ananias and, and Safara, when we lay things at the feet of Jesus, they are half truths. They are things that are baked, baked truths. Forgive us for this hypocrisy. Father, make us genuine believers who hunger and thirst for the things of God. Make us genuine in our walk, in our confession, O oh Jesus. I pray that you touch our lives. I pray that you grow us. I pray that you do something new in us, Lord. We don't want to be used by Satan. We want to be used by the mighty God, stewards of the kingdom. We want to be used by you. Give us grace. Give us favor. Forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray.
May God bless you. May God keep you. Don't be a pretender. Be genuine in your work. God bless you.